Hello YouTube and welcome to the 100k special. Today I'm taking you with me on a journey, a grand adventure in the mountains that my ancestors have been calling home for hundreds of years, which also happens to be the place where my quest for self-improvement began. Now, there can be no training arc without a gym, but since the closest one is roughly 70 kilometers away, I decided a decade ago to transform the family smokehouse into my own personal dungeon. This is where my forefathers have been preparing meats to be stored for the winter months, and where I have spent many summers battering myself under the blistering heat. Year after year, I've accumulated more equipment, which amounts to a few rusty weight plates, dumbbells, one barbell and lifting implements that I carry around with me in a luggage, and that totally didn't get me in trouble with border control. It isn't much, but it's really all you need for a training arc. All there is left for me to do is walk hard, and let the majesty of the mountains breathe new gains into me. Speaking of which, this won't be your typical training vlog, meaning you're not about to watch 30 minutes of me sweating it out in a tiny smokehouse somewhere in the middle of the mountains. I know some of you might enjoy that, and there will of course be multiple video segments covering my training, but it would be a great disservice to you if I didn't also include more mindful interludes, pockets of time spent discussing my mindset and life philosophy, always accompanied by the gorgeous backdrop of nature. This 100k special won't be spectacular, and the training methods I will share with you guys aren't revolutionary. But I hope you will come out of it changed, and to do that, it must first and foremost be honest, vulnerable, and raw. I'm going to open up on topics I've never discussed before, reveal things I've kept from you, and overall transform back into what I am. Another human just like you, going through this human experience with you. I've been coming to these mountains since the age of two, and I've walked this path more times than I care to count, either to help my grandparents tend to the fields, or to make my way into the wild. These forest-covered mountains looming in the background of my childhood, full of goblins and wolves, always within sight but forever out of reach. It is said here that if you see a peak, you can get to it, and that is true. But what they don't tell you is that once you reach it, you will see another one, then another one, then another one. Once it begins, the journey is never over. Interestingly, the same is true for bodybuilding. Once you reach your goal, you realize that you still have much of the mountain to climb. Sometimes, it can be discouraging to look up and realize that you're not even halfway through or that others are scrambling up their peak much faster than you. Instead, look around. This is the view that only those who put in the work get to enjoy. The higher you get, the bigger the void underneath your feet. Yes, there is much to lose in a fall, and most of the way is still in front of you. This will forever remain true. The day you started climbing is the day you decided that falling wasn't an option. The only way for you is up. But that's also what makes it fun. After 15 years of training, I still find weaknesses in my physique and things I can improve. This leads us back to the mountain training arc and my overall goal during this trip to prepare for the upcoming years. I will only spend 10 days training in the smokehouse, not sufficient to make significant gains, but enough to prime my body for a new type of specialization that will dictate the theme of my next few years of training. I've realized that I have more than enough biceps, traps and chest to spare. As such, these muscle groups will be taking a step back in the future, in favor of less developed areas. It won't mean that I'll stop training them altogether, just that I will find ways to hit these muscles while prioritizing others. 
Overall, entirely depriving a body part of volume in order to play catch up is a bad idea. You still want to put in some work, but if you can skew the exercise towards another area, it's two birds with one stone. These curls are a good example. They still train the biceps to some degree, but most of the stress is put on the brachialis and brachioradialis, putting the emphasis on the forearms. Pronation is my new religion. All the bicep volume on that trip will be in that fashion. The mornings are dedicated to arm work, and the evenings to legs. A throwback to how I used to train 10 years ago. I wasn't always bodybuilding. There used to be a time when I trained for sports. Football first, then basketball. Back then, my routine was very simple. I would wake up at 8am and go run in the mountains for a few hours. I did this to beat the heat, which in these regions easily reaches 100 degrees Fahrenheit at noon. This habit of mine even gave birth to urban legends. Because so few humans live there, you regularly come across the same people, and soon enough, those of the Pueblos were discussing this mysterious young man, who could be seen running up the hills of the monte, hood over his head. Where was he running, and from what? Old timers here couldn't fathom the idea that someone could be exercising for the heck of it. They who had spent their entire lives laboring to feed their families. To them, physical exertion was a necessary part of existence. To me, it was an obsession. Regardless of how I felt, I would wake up and run. I still run to this day, but after a different type of goal. My new Moby Dick is hypertrophy. Half an inch on my arm, better defined obliques, that's what I'm chasing now. But when the closest lat machine is 3 hours away, you have to come up with alternatives. Thankfully, nature is generous and it provides us with everything we need. A simple walk in the forest took me directly to the perfect pull-up spot. A little clearing on the side of a cliff, directly overlooking my village. All it took was a little cleanup to make the area navigable, and I was ready to put in work. There's something special about doing calisthenics in the wild. To loop your rings around a branch and to have each of your reps accompanied by the bristling of the leaves and the sound of your breath. Commercial gyms are surely optimal when it comes to building muscle, but they are also cold, impersonal and modern. In my little corner of the wood, surrounded by the forest, I felt truly at home. As for pull-ups, they are easily the best calisthenics movement for your back, and one of my favorite exercises of all time. I know that as long as I live, I will never tire of them. This only really applies to bodybuilding. Despite the image I project, I'm a fickle guy. If something doesn't keep me stimulated, I give it up. Throughout my life, this has resulted in numerous heartbreaks. Things that I told myself I would love until the day I died suddenly turned bland in my mouth, prompting me to spit them out with disgust. This happened with football. There was a time where I would get up every day at 6am to go sprint in the park for an hour before class. I would listen to motivational tapes, hype myself up in the bathroom, and go into the dark into the rain and the cold and the first rays of sun, at a time when the only people around were slumbering junkies digesting their recent binge, and caffeinated workers cutting through the park to gain 5 minutes on their daily commute. I even remember a day when I broke down in tears in front of my mother, shattered that she would not let me train on that particular evening. How could I make the NFL if I skipped that lifting session? This is how foolishly in love I used to be with football. The flames of passion burned in my heart with such fanatism that it ended up eroding my brain. Then one day, all of that was gone. Suddenly, I didn't care about football anymore. The thing that made me want to get up in the morning was no longer there. Instead, I was left with the memory of it, and the recollection of what I had lost. Is it better to never love or to love and then lose it? That's a trick question. 
you don't get to choose. That same scenario, that falling out of love has happened to me several times in my life, and it never gets easier. Each loss is a part of me I swore loyalty to, suddenly disappearing into the void. This is to the point where I can no longer be certain of anything. Will I still be true to my values in 5 years? Who knows? Sturdier rocks have been moved before. There are only two things that appear evident to me. The first is that I will be bodybuilding for as long as I live, simply because without it, I cannot be. It is such an integral part of my identity that to not lift weights would be the equivalent of breathing without lungs. The second is that I will always love these mountains. In the same vein, I have been coming here for so long that they look as familiar to me as my own face, each path murmuring the memories of those childhood escapades that put on my tongue the taste of freedom and independence. These mountains are strong. The sun that beams over them is the same that has shined on the backs of my ancestors through famines, through invasions, through hardships and through pain. How could I fail them? This is why I hit legs, even on vacation. In the past, leg day in the mountains was a big conundrum. You're not getting a squat rack around these parts, and even buying a decent barbell and 45 pound plates to go with it is a wager. So instead, I do what I can. If there's not enough weight to challenge me, and I can't even get a barbell on my back to start with, then I do my squats holding dumbbells on an incline. At such an end goal, even 50 pounds per hand is challenging, granted I stay within a high rep range. This is the type of resourcefulness that makes the difference between those who make it and those who don't. If you can train in a smokehouse with minimal equipment, then you can train anywhere. This is why I think that everyone should go through a mountain training arc of their own. A time during which you have to come up with innovative solutions to make up for a lack of resources. This is true in both the material and spiritual sense. To have experienced scarcity is the key to gratefulness, and therefore happiness. Grateful to who? To my grandma, who religiously kept my weight stored away and clean during the five years I couldn't come back to visit her. Happy to do what? To get to lift weights in an area of the wood where the average person doesn't even know what a dumbbell is. I wasn't always like that. There used to be a time when I was a resentful little twat. I was smaller than other kids and not particularly attractive. As such, I hated myself and I hated everyone because other people my age were a constant reminder of what I didn't have. What I didn't have. This is all that mattered to me. Screw the fact that I was perfectly healthy with a loving family and a stable living situation. I wasn't popular and that was justification enough to curse my life. Eventually, however, I grew tired of being mediocre. I knew that something had to change. That something, of course, was me. But I took a long time to realize it, because I also knew that I would now have to kill this old version of myself, and that this sacrifice would not come without pain. This explains, by the way, why some people do the opposite. They demand that the world change for them, because this doesn't require any effort on their part. I was tired of living life as a coward, but I also understood that the roots of mediocrity reached deep into my being, and that pulling them out would be a long and strenuous process. Still, I proceeded. Starting from the age of 15, I started training. Little by little, bit by bit, I strengthened my weak body. It wasn't much. 10 girl push-ups on Monday, 10 shell curls on Tuesday, but it was all I could handle. For two years, this was my regimen. Then at 17, I got my first weight set, two dumbbells and some plates. It came in a black luggage, which meant that wherever I went, the weights went with me, the mountains being no exception. For an entire summer, I would run in the morning and lift weights in the afternoon, hours at a time, without exception. 
There was no rest day. There was no deload. There was only work. I was absolutely obsessed with the process because I could feel that with each training session, I was getting closer to my objective to become a new man and be rebirthed again. But every dramatic transformation needs a dramatic catalyst and to kill my old self, I needed a stake. That stake came in the form of a road, a steep road running up the face of a cliff. I had ridden that road hundreds of times before, always by bike, each time failing to conquer it, my legs giving up before I could reach the top. Each time, I would have to dismount the bike and pitifully push it up the hill, reminded in that moment that I had once more failed to conquer what stood in my way. I would always give up around the same point, past the turn in the path that made me hope that maybe, just maybe I was about to be done, but that only opened on a new patch of straight road, my spirit broken by the certitude that I would never be able to complete it. The same limitations plagued my life. I always sold myself short, convinced that I would fail before the act. As such, I never attempted anything. Or if I did, it was half-hearted, and I abandoned at the slightest sign of hardship. But one day, something changed. There was nothing special about that day. I wasn't particularly well rested or motivated, and yet, this is the day that changed my life. Arriving at the dreaded spot, I was about to step off the bike when I realized one thing. There was no difference between the me that would continue on and the me that would stop, save that one had decided not to quit and the other didn't. If I quit now, I would quit forever. At that moment, I decided to become the one that didn't quit, and I rode on, past my limits, past my own self-limiting beliefs, I rode on. The distance left to travel stopped mattering to me. All that mattered was that I continued. Regardless of what happened to me at that moment, I refused to step off the bike. I would fall off the cliff before I'd let that happen. When I reached the top of the hill and finally dismounted, I was no longer the same person I was when I started. That guy was left somewhere at the bottom of the hill. I didn't know his name, and to this day don't care to ask. He was no longer me. I was no longer the kid I used to be. I was free. It is to honor that promise that I train. Lifting has this power that it can give you anything you've ever wanted, as long as you're willing to pay the price for it. When I was a kid, I dreamt of having big arms, ashamed of the two spaghettis attached to my shoulders. At 28, I now have 18 inches arms. This is the type of transformation that only commitment will get you. As for how to get there, it's simple. Pick any isolation exercise you enjoy and blast them. For me, it was always curls, I have always been an arm bro, and big biceps are my aesthetic of choice. However, this has also left me with a pretty significant muscular imbalance that I'm now attempting to correct by focusing much more on forearms and triceps. For forearms, these pronation twists are killer. Not only do they load the brachioradialis like no other, but they also keep the tension there throughout the entirety of the movement. If it weren't for pronator fatigue, I'd be doing these every 48 hours. When it comes to triceps, you can't go wrong with pushdowns. And if you don't have access to a machine, no worries. Just tie a resistance band to something and find an implement to push against. I wonder if my forefathers predicted that one of their ancestors would attach a resistance band to the place where they used to hang ham to dry. I think about that a lot. How often do we really think about the people that came before us, and how much time do we spend wondering about those that come after? The answer is, not enough. The defining trait of modernity is that we only really care about the past and future when it benefits us. We look down on our ancestors as inferior, as backward and stupid, as a way to feel better about what we have become. 
and only glance towards the future to check for any signs of our upcoming destruction. In doing so, we even forget to live in the present. This constant forward escape is made possible by an environment that keeps us purposefully stimulated and therefore distracted. It is fascinating the amount of energy we expend only to run from ourselves. Thank God for forests, for little streams and lakes, for wherever man is not, that is also where man can find himself. When I look back at the hours of solitude spent lifting weights, I realize that I wouldn't take back a single one of them. However, I do regret the nights spent drinking with people whose company felt to me like the bitterest loneliness, along with the things I did to make them like me, which ultimately made me dislike myself. This is why I desperately cling to bodybuilding, because I have the intimate notion that the version of me I killed and that I hate so much isn't really gone. It's just behind the door, waiting to take over my life again. But for each rep I do, I take another step away from it. Bonus point if these are ordeal reps, and you do them stiff-legged. Something I don't usually do, but was forced to experiment with during this trip, because of the limited amount of weights at my disposal. I can now say with certitude that these are no joke. The amount of stretch on the hammies is unmatched, and they also stretch the upper back in a way that makes me suspect that these might be very good for middle and lower traps. And that's great, because as I've said previously, the only trap volume I'll be receiving will be from non-isolation exercises my focus going forward being on the lats in particular. As far as the core, you can never have too much abs, but you can skew your training towards growing certain areas in particular. And for me, that will be the obliques. I'm going after that Fanny's Hercules look, and to achieve that, twisted sit-ups will be a weapon of choice. Even without weight, these are ridiculously challenging, granted you maintain a slow tempo. Earlier, I told you that after this faithful awakening on the bike, I had forever changed for the better. I lied. It was as I feared. The corpse I had left at the bottom of the hill had followed me, only waiting for a moment of weakness to reclaim its rightful reign on my life. That moment occurred during my first year of college. After entering two difficult years in one of the top high schools of my district, I got rejected by every single prestigious university, and ended up in a subpar college. All of my hard work had been for nothing. I was now stuck taking classes with people who I knew were losers, which meant that I was a loser too. At this point, I gave up. I stopped going to classes, I would spend 10 hours a day playing League of Legends. Eventually, I even stopped training. After all, what's the point? I slowly but surely reverted into what I used to be. I had become the corpse again. Except this time, I had no reason to change. I had already proven to myself that every transformation could be reverted, and that every climb eventually led to a fall. After all, I had fallen off the bike, didn't I? So I refused to climb. Like a coward, I stayed at the foot of the mountain, turned my back on the past and closed my eyes to the future. At this point, I was already dead. Life had no meaning because I refused to give it one. I would like to tell you that I woke up one day and fixed myself, but it never happened. I was content being mediocre. That was until I went back to my mountains. Something happened to me there, as if the flow of life was forcefully breathed into my lungs. It felt like the voices of my ancestors rose up around me, angry at what I had become. Slowly but surely, I started training again. In the smokehouse, I put together the pieces of my broken self, the very statue that I had built only two years prior in that very place. It all came back to me then, as if the year I had spent depressed was only a nightmare that I had just woken up from, to find that it didn't really matter. Yes, I had fallen off the bike, but I could get back up again. And this is all that mattered. To get back up. To keep trying. So what if I got rejected by my college of choice? 
My self-worth did not depend on the appreciation of others. I owed it to myself and the people that love me to become the best version of myself. On my last day there, I made a promise. A promise to the trees, to the mountains, and to the very soul of my ancestors. But most importantly, a promise to myself. On that day, I promised that I would never give up again. That corpse running behind me, it's not me. It's the person I refuse to be. For as long as I live, I will keep outpacing it, because this is what I was put on this earth to do. Be the version of myself I envision. In order to do that, I will never give up. The same goes for this channel. I am dedicated to bring you the best content I can possibly create. And I will keep putting in my best effort to be a positive influence on your life. Thank you for the 100k subs, but most importantly, thank you for walking that path with me.